Hey, Shauna, do you ever have questions about how our muscle is affected by like what we eat and the supplements that we might take or these GLP-1 medications? You ever thought about this? All day and all night, Allie. So many questions and we have a lot of answers from Stu Phillips, who is the professor and Canadian research chair of skeletal muscle at McMaster University. We're so excited to have him on the podcast. And I want to give a shout out before we get going to one of our Girls Talk Healthy Aging listeners, Miss Debbie Seymour. Thank you so much for listening and supporting the Girls Talk Healthy Aging. Let's dive in. Welcome to the Girls Talk Healthy Aging podcast where we dive deep into pressing health and fitness issues facing aging women. I'm Allie Kerr. And I'm Shauna Kaminsky. And together we'll bring candid conversations, expert advice, and personal stories that will inspire and empower you on your own wellness journey. Well, Stu, I have been looking forward to this talk for a very long time. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. We are always going on about resistance training, particularly for women. And given your position, uh, you know, we just want you to agree with us and tell you to <laughs> tell us, sure. tell our listeners all the reasons why women need to resistance train. Yeah, well, I, I think we're all drinking the Kool-Aid. I, we're all preaching the converted, which is always a great conversation to have. So, uh, you know, I, I, I often start this off with with pointing out to people that um, if we use self-report, what, what, what people say they're doing, I think between, you know, 20 and 30 percent of Canadians, Americans sort of say, hey, yeah, I do some form of strengthening exercise. I think the reality is what I would consider to be resistance training is probably done by maybe about half that number. And when you divide it up into uh, men and women, uh, women don't account for even about a third of that. So m most women are not not lifting weights. They're not they're not trying to stay strong or get stronger. And so I always point out the biggest difference would be taking somebody who's doing nothing to doing something. So please, you know, um, start. Uh, that's that's the big takeaway. Uh, I think the benefits now we're beginning to realize are, are probably from a health standpoint on par with engaging in 150 minutes a week of aerobic activity. Um, some health domains, it's even better. Um, but from the standpoint of physical function and, you know, the stats say is that ladies are going to last a lot longer than the guys out there. The bottom line is, uh, you know, most women spend that time in institutionalized care. So it's really about an investment and sort of paying it forward um, and trying to maintain functional muscles and the ability to do activities of daily living. So, you know, all, all the things that I'm sure we we can all agree on, but it's uh, it, it's probably, I don't know if it's, it's definitely as important, maybe even more important for women to be stronger as they age than, than men, to be honest with you. Yeah, well, can we... I was going to say, can you tell us about the aerobics revolution to strength training and why strength training seems to be getting <laughs> all the press now, but forever, especially for women, it was Kenneth Cooper, it was aerobic. Yeah, whole... yeah, yeah. That's, you know, that's that's interesting, isn't it? Because I, uh, I sat in on a, uh, well, I was an examiner on a PhD defense earlier this week, and uh, this was in, uh, this young guy had done some re research and pe people post-stroke. And said, you know, post-stroke survival, like barely any of them engage in resistance training. It, it, like it's a lot of it is sort of functional training and everything else like that, which is fine. Um, and the average age of the folks in his sample was about 62. And I said, well, cast your mind back to when these men, uh, but forget about the women for now, um, were in their teens and their 20s. What, who, who their role model was for for weightlifting and you know he goes oh geez you know, he's in his 20s right he doesn't know uh so it's probably Arnold Schwarzenegger uh you know he was the big guy back in those days and why would that be a role model for any woman to take up resistance training you know so I think that you know as you said Ken Cooper uh the guru of aerobics and uh no kidding like he he gave us the word and and the results from the longitudinal study have really spoken volumes and no question underpin the 150 minutes a week, but we just haven't really had good role models for, uh, well, health, I suppose, is the big one, not just being a big guy, 
uh, but particularly for women uh, to to lift weights and, you know, good or bad. And I'm not going to, you know, give, give it a ring endorsement, but I will say this is that uh, CrossFit, uh, you know, love it or hate it. And I get it. It polarizes some people, but it, it put uh, resistance training kind of on the map for a lot of women and, and showed women that it was fine. It was acceptable to be strong. It was okay to have, um, you know, I would say a muscular physique, but a physique that wasn't traditionally feminine. So I think it's a lack of role modeling. I think it's just a, a timing thing, but now it's, it's, it's coming into its own. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's a great time for people like me to be in the business of doing the research on it. But as I pointed out to this young guy on, uh, I think it was Monday or Tuesday, uh, you know, uh, name me a study that hasn't shown benefit from resistance training and insert whatever population you want, post-stroke, multiple sclerosis, w older women, frail women, sarcopenic women, you know, and he's like, I can't think of one. And I'm like, exactly. So, uh, yeah, good times. Yeah. It, it, it's kind of like menopause in that, <laughs> you know, social media is all over it. And, and part of the message with, you know, older women is that resistance training is, is the answer, the fountain mm. of youth It's going yeah. to bring quality to your years. So speaking of which, uh, I have a couple questions, but first Go is, can we build muscle late in our later years, particularly in menopause? Yeah. Uh, so I'll say this, um, I, I'm married. Um, my wife's going through menopause right now. So I hear a lot about it, no lived experience. So, but I, I will say this, it's interesting for, for her to say some things. And I'm like, well, we must know the answer to that question. And you go and you look and it, it like to say it's shocking is, is probably an understatement. So, and I made this point to somebody just the other day, they, they were talking about health and then everything. And I said, well, health is men's health. There, there is really no women's health. You know, there's, <laughs> there's a little dabble here and there. Oh, I, oh, I don't know. You know, like I said, well, just go and have a look. Uh, and so it's this sort of, you know, mystery shrouded time of a woman's life where I think the message is pretty clear about bone, uh, but bone pulls on, or excuse me, muscle pulls on a tendon that pulls on a bone. That's, that's the message around why muscle is important. But as you say, uh, it's not just a bone message, it's a muscle message, it's a strength message. And it really is about trying to preserve that function through that transitional period and manage maybe some of the symptoms that go along. But uh, I'm fond of saying that, you know, we don't even know what causes a hot flash. And believe me, if men were suffering from hot flashes and, <laughs> and like there would be a congressional task force and we would be, you know, the, the, the NIH budget would be substantially increased in that area. But, you know, it, so uh, I, I just think it's, uh, it's, it's long overdue. And so I'm glad the conversation's happening and uh, trying to help uh, a lot of women that are in a tough spot and, and basically transition to the next phase of their lives and, and in, in a good shape. And, and be be ready to outlive probably their their male partner and uh, everybody else around them. So uh, that's the that's the game plan. But correct me if I'm wrong. Research is showing that muscle can be gained at any phase of life. I beg your pardon. Yes, no, it's spot on. I mean, I okay. think that uh, one of the things that uh, it slows down and it slows yes. down in men, it slows down in women. There's no question about that. It, you know, nothing that I'm telling you is uh, we were not turning back aging. I wish we were. Um, but I mean, I think that the, the, the real take home is, is that soft tissue adaptation. So muscle adaptations can occur at just about any phase of your life. And uh, it used to be that you know, women had a tougher time post-menopause. And I think that, that generally speaking, that's true gaining muscle, but they can definitely get stronger. They can gain back some muscle. And I think that the point I, I like to make to people is not that, you know, I mean, we're all sort of sliding downhill at, at a certain rate. And the, the idea is to not slide downhill in, at a steep rate, but to slow that curve. So instead of a pitch curve like this, you know, just sort of a, a, a kind of a flatter decline and, and, uh, you know, age, age happens. It, it is what it is, but, um, make the most of the time that you have and, and resistance training and being strong, having muscle is, is one of the key foundations to that piece. Well, I think the message I want to get across is that to the, the woman that has never 
picked up a weight or done yeah. even body weight training, any kind of resistance training to tell them it's never too late. Yeah. And, and, you know, you might not look like, you know, super muscular, sure. but it's not about the aesthetics. It's about the function. Yeah. And, and, and how it makes you feel. I mean, one of the key, I think, takeaways around uh, resistance training for reasons I, I don't know, I don't know enough about it to say, but um, p- people feel better. Uh, their, their mental health improved. We've got uh, several large, what we call meta-analyses now looking at the incidence of anxiety and depression in people and the actual use of resistance training in, in those folks um, and it alleviates some of those symptoms, sometimes on par with the type of relief that you would get with a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. So top of the line, anti-anxiety, anti-depression type medication. And, and, you know, it's not that that doesn't happen with aerobic, but it doesn't happen to the same degree. And I, I, we don't, we don't know why that that's the case. So, um, but, but that's, that's some powerful stuff, I think, from a mental health standpoint. So hopefully it's not just, you know, I'm, I'm doing this because, but you're doing it to, to feel better as well. And, and I think taking a little bit of control, uh, you know, of your, your future, you, uh, your, your destiny, so to speak, physically anyway. So, uh- I have several questions about research because I know sure. here in the U.S. we Google and we're like, I Google, I'm researching, you know, <laughs> Google that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So sure. I want you. So, so my first question is, like, take walk us through in your in your world what research is, what that uh-huh. looks like, just helping our listeners understand what because you are a researcher. This is what you sure. do. Yeah. And you've done lots of research, and and I'm pretty sure your research doesn't just involve getting on Google. And doing a, a quick search. Yeah, so I want to hear usually. more about that. Sure. Can you help educate us on what that looks like? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, the biggest thing is is research costs money. Um, I mean, I I like to think of myself as I, I'm the you know the principal investigator around here. So I spend a lot of time uh, writing grants to get money to do the work that we do to pay. For the most part, uh, masters or PhD students. Sometimes uh, people are post PhD, what we call postdocs, and they're the people that uh, do the work. So I mean, everybody goes, "Oh, like you're so you know industrious." So I'm like, you know, okay. So I look good because a lot of really young, energetic folks, um, you know, are earning advanced degrees, and uh, I, I just look good in their reflected hard work. And you know, I'll be honest about that. They do they do the hard work. Um, it's a lot of time. Uh, I think the thing that would probably surprise most people to know is that from the time of like inception of an idea to obtaining the money, to doing the research, to publishing the research, it's probably in our field, at least somewhere between three to five years. And, and I think most people would, you know, think, oh, like how, how does it take so long? But if you're working with, with people, um, we, we don't do animal research, uh, you know, people are busy, right? Like we we take we've got lots of students here. They're they're awesome. Um, we've got lots of people who are over age sixty five, and everybody says, "Well, why don't we do a study in perimenopausal women?" I can confidently say we have some money to do that right now. Um, but try and line these women up. They are busy people, right? And so it, it, it's a lot of planning, a lot of scheduling. Um, you know, hand on my heart, I'll say that. Uh, you know the students that do the work are man they they uh, they bring me to work they they're, they're the reason why I do this stuff and uh, they work hard to figure all this stuff out and get people in and and comply and then uh, you know so it's um it, it it's a tough road uh, it it's not easy I mm-hmm. think is the biggest thing and and I wish I could tell people there's a shortcut there's a way to do it but um, it's just a lot of grinding, but uh, I, I love what I do. So maybe it's, uh, I, I don't work too hard after all, or I enjoy what I do. It's just a. Well, three to five years is a long time in TikTok world or Instagram yeah, world. And you're, and you're, <laughs> three to you're five look, years to get an answer. Know, like You're that's looking a long for time. an instant answer. And, you know, yeah. a lot of people say, and I'm like, you know, I, I say I don't know a lot. Right. And, and they go, what do you mean for, you don't know? Yes. And I'm like, well, we don't know. I, like, I, mean, I can make something up, but that's not the business I'm in. <laughs> and that is the business that 
I mean, too many, so many people are in online is because there's so much we don't know. Yep. And if you can speak, I've been in, I've been a subject in a couple of research okay. stu- studies. Right. So if you can kind of talk about like, you know, you mentioned meta-analysis, like what is yeah, that? Yeah. Or how does the study work? You know, I know mm-hmm. we, we know it takes time. It takes mm-hmm. funding. You know, who decides? Is it, does someone come to you with the idea and the funding? Do you come up with the ideas? How does all of that work? Yeah, for the most part, it's 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 us coming up with the ideas. Uh, I mean, there might be some what we call solicited calls or sometimes industry partners say, you know, we've got this product, we'd like to test it. The university is very careful to say, well, no matter what happens, we get to publish the data. So, you know, that's been, a, I think, a revelation for some people. Um, but but we're we're coming up with the plans. We're 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 driving the research question. Uh, generally, it's government funding. Sometimes there are industry government partner schemes. Uh, sometimes it's philanthropic funding. It it just depends. Um, I, I I like to say <laughs> I'm kind of a professional beggar. My hands are out the the entire time to try and get the money to do the work that we do. Uh, it's, and then it always starts with a contract negotiation, uh, an ethics application to make sure we're doing everything uh, kosher. We've got to register the trial, um, and then we've got to get all the personnel in place. And uh, you know, it's um, yeah, it's it's a pretty complex process. And you know, if you've been a participant in, in any human research, you'll know uh, we ask a lot of the folks that come in and do our studies. So. I, I mean, I'm around, I'm not involved as much, but the last thing I do when they exit the study is genuinely say, thank you very much for your time. Uh, generally your blood, uh, your muscles sometimes, you know, everything that you've given us. And, uh, because we can't, we can't do this without you. Um, we do pay people, uh, if you work it out on an hourly basis, you, you never should do that because it's not a lot of money. Um, so, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a pretty selfless act to be part of, you know, human research and particularly our stuff. I mean, we're not, mm-hmm. we're not winning any Nobel prizes. We're, we're just doing some exercise work and trying to get people healthier and better and learn a few things along the way. So. And there's not always a lot of funding, I'm sure. <laughs> for that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's the other <laughs> thing. I think everybody's, yeah, maybe perception of funding success is a little bit warped. Uh, I'd say that the average success rate uh, for most sort of government level fundings is 10% or below. So 100 people apply, 10 people will get the money. And, uh, you know, that's not a good average rate. So, mm. <laughs> Yeah. I, I think the big thing for our listeners is, you know, uh, maybe some direction in terms of when they're Googling for an answer. Rather than, or, you know, looking for something rather than going to social media or, you know, who, who they may seem like, like there's so many doctors on social media that are skewing information, misleading purposely or not. So how do, how does, you know, just a regular person discover is, is this real? Yeah. How do you get to the bottom of this? It's difficult. It's very mm-hmm. difficult. Uh, I, I talk to my students a lot about trying to find, we call it the signal in the noise, like the the real thing, uh, you know, aside from all of the, the stuff that's coming at you, at, uh, you know, like, I don't even know how fast anymore, but really fast. And uh, it's not it's not easy to do. So I mean, you know, we spend a lot of time talking about critical thinking and about going to reputable websites. So, you know, PubMed is is one that's used by the US government that I think is sort of globally recognized as, you know, a source of information. But the truth is, is that social media, and so, you know, I I I, I run I used to run a first year like introductory, so freshman level uh human nutrition and metabolism class. And we used to do an assignment. Somebody got an article out of the newspaper clipped it, which, you know, dates me as in, cause people just don't do that anymore, especially kids in first year. Um, and, and then they had to find the source of what the, where the information came from and say, you know, how good a job did the journalist or whoever wrote the piece, you know, do of, of interpreting the science just to show them how sometimes it got a little warped. Um, and, you know, over the years of teaching that now I asked them, I said, well, where do you guys go for your news? They're like, oh, you know, like TikTok, you know, Instagram. And, you know, part of me just rolls my eyes and I'm like, that that's, that's not, I mean, there are legitimate news outlets on both of those platforms, but 
you know, if you're just listening to some random person, then uh, that could be signal or it could be, and for the most part, it's usually just noise. And, and it's very, very difficult, I'll be honest. Um, so, you know, try and find a people you trust uh, that are usually giving a lot of answers that are unsatisfying in terms of, I, I hate to say that, but, you know, finding the answer that you want. Um, but, and, and say a lot of times, you know what, we're, we're really not sure about that because, you know, that, that, that's a, the, a few of those are kind of catchphrases that I say, that's a lot of the answers that I give. Like, I mean, I can give you a, a guess, um, or I can give you what I think. Uh, but, uh, but I'll always say, well, I, I'm not really sure, but I, I would think that, um, and, and, you know, that's the, that's the true answer as opposed to, you know, an authoritative you know, this is this is the answer, which is fine. They happen sometimes, but not all the time. Yeah, and especially when it sounds too good to be true, or when the uh, yeah the yeah, problem yeah. is created, and then who the authority comes up with the answer. And oh, by the way, you just have to buy this product or service. Yeah, we just have to know, you know, what the you know what people are doing out there, and so sure. finding you know different sources to corroborate the the answer so to yeah speak. well i mean that's the platform of your podcast right i mean this is the idea is to try and bring you know information to people that they can trust hopefully and uh yeah i mean i i, I it, it's 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 very difficult and and you know i i got three boys and they're all in their early 20s now and i listen to them talk and some of the things i'm like you guys need to check your sources and they roll their eyes and you know, his dad know, right? And uh, and I'm like, you know, seriously, like, the, and so now there's a little bit, the oldest in particular, he goes, what do you think of this? And I'm like, yeah, I'm not, not bad, like pretty good. Um, I said, but this stuff, that's, that's, that's not true. <laughs> and so it, eventually it comes back, but um, yeah, there's a lot of, you know, uh, online hero worship. I really like this guy. And I'm like, mm, I'm a little skeptical, frankly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Mm, because, yeah. I mean, honestly, I found you on Instagram. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> with this random guy. Yeah. <laughs> so there are a lot of legitimate people that are but, trying to mm, set the record straight. But, yeah. but I think the key is that person such as yourself, you don't have anything and you don't have sexy solutions. No. Your, no. you know, your content might be a little bit I don't say boring, but yeah, I, yeah, it's a little dry. Yeah, I, I know I've been told as much. I mean, I, 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 and I think that that's that's the that's the hard part about you know not having the type of sizzle of the New York Times bestseller or somebody who produces you know content for Instagram that's you know like be way beyond my my meter. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly, and and so. Uh, I, I agree. I, I think that there are a lot of people probably like me out there sort of trying to get the, the, the good word, quote unquote, across. But at the same yeah. time, they're coming over as like a, as that dry academic guy again. Like, And, and I, I try, honestly, I try. Oh, and I, I, I don't mean any disrespect. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's, I, I get it. I totally get it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there are it's, people who do it, do it well and uh, who I think you can trust. And there are people who you know, do it well. And I'm like, listen no. to this person. It's yeah. Just crazy. And then there's so many people that can entertain well, but yep. and they can sell well, but yep. what they're selling is just selling. It's yep. just to make profit. It's not to actually help. Yeah. <laughs> it's tough. It is it really, is, really the tough. The deck is stacked. And we've said this in another episode, the deck is really stacked against consumers it, that it are is. looking for it real is. information. Yeah. Yep. So thank oh, you. Absolutely. Thank you for, for being a voice in the, in all the madness. Trying. That, <laughs> Trying. Yeah, we, we definitely appreciate that. What about, uh, so one of our things that ladies always want to know when we have guests on, especially if it's someone like we'll have females on that are inspiring, that have mm -hmm. like reached physical feats or, or aging well. And yeah. our ladies want to know, like, what are they taking? What what, what are the supplements that they're taking? You know, yeah. and things that are popular right now in fitness, like recovery stuff is really popular. Mm -hmm. Red light therapy is popular. Um, right. BCAAs, I know we, we talked about them before. Those are still, they those still have a place. Yeah. The, the pre-workouts, the post-workouts, the BCAAs, yeah. the glutamine, the creatine, yeah. the red light, the 
cold plunge, the sauna, yeah. all the things. Like, can you enlighten us on any of that? Do you have any thoughts? Sure. Well, well let's start with the with the supplements because okay. that kind of speaks. I mean, you know, our, our research program here is all about muscle, right? I mean, that's the tissue in the middle. And so what, what can you do to support it? And, uh, you know, I've, I've been involved in a lot of work. I, I hang around with a lot of really smart people and I listen to their talks and, and I, I, I learn a lot just by doing what I do and being around them, to be frank. Um, when, when you really dig, and I mean really dig, so this meta-analysis is looking at all of the trials that are out there and coming up with a message that is not just one trial showed this, one trial showed this, but actually the net sum of all of the trials, if you like. So it's really, you know, you put them all in, you shake them, and then the distillate that comes out is like, so this is the top of the evidence pile. Um, you, you really come down to a pretty short shelf as far as supplements are concerned. So for me, that's, that's protein. Uh, and I think we could, you know, unequivocally say, I think we need more than the minimum that's out there, the, the recommended dietary allowance, maybe at least twice that. I think that's true for men and women, particularly the more active you are. Uh, creatine, is a supplement for muscles and, and probably it helps bone too. But beyond that, it may help brain function. And to be honest, that's kind of why I take it these days, kind of hoping that it'll stave off and trying to keep me cognitively sharp as long as I can. Uh, in the winter, it's, it's vitamin D. Uh, I live pretty far north, and so we don't get a lot of sunshine in the winter. And uh, that's that's high on my list. And then the only other one is is omega three, and uh, I take that uh, from. You got to make sure it's a. I think a pretty you you get what you pay for, so a good source, and make sure it's certified as non oxidized, and uh, you can kind of go from there. The rest it, it drops off pretty quick in terms of actual evidence that that something does. You know, so BCAAs they seem to be immune to uh, any sort of negative research because the, the truth is is that most of the research has either found that they don't do anything or that if they have an effect it's it's very small um so you know it's pretty marginal when you you're getting into protein intakes the type that I'm recommending which you can do with food you don't need you don't need like supplements are convenient no question but but you can do it with food but BCAAs seem to be you know they're just impervious and they they kind of they go away and then they come back again. And then they're, they're in just about every, you know, drink that's out there. I couldn't tell you much about red light, uh, but I'll be honest to say that if it were something that's pretty good uh, in the vein of, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Uh, and there are a few exceptions. Um, I, I haven't heard too much about it. The hot cold plunge now really all over the place. Uh, it used to be it was always ice and it was always cold. And then now we're thinking that actually that causes blood vessels to constrict. And if you do that too much, then you don't get the blood flow and you don't get the adaptation. But a lot of people will say, you know, it feels good. I, I feel great. Or if I, if I do a sauna after, I feel great. And a, there's a big part of me that goes, well, if you feel good, and if that feel good makes you come back and do this again, then who am I to tell you not to do it? And I, I don't think there's anything that's really sort of stripping too much away. But let's just say if you keep doing one thing, uh, maybe it's time to kind of change things up. So if you're a traditional ice plunge person, uh, I think maybe try a, a warm plunge or even a contrast or something. See how you feel after that. But um you know, I, we could go on. We could do the whole yeah. podcast on these what, things, right? Well, as far as like muscle and fat, those things are even talked about, you know, as being something that affects your muscle or your fat um, tissue. So uh, yeah. any, research, any research on that that you are aware of? You know, the, the, the muscle story is pretty clear now is that the cold plunge post-workout it is not a good idea. You're, 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 you're constricting blood vessels and then you're, you're basically slowing down blood flow to the tissue. Uh, it, it actually may be better to to, to get in a sauna or, or get, you know, use a warm shower or something like that. Um, from the standpoint of the fat burning, uh, you know, uh, if I had an answer to that beyond the drugs that are out there, uh, I, I'd be sitting in Tahiti Skyping it or, uh, you know, zooming in from this interview. I, 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 you know, I'd be like, yeah, I can probably fit you in between this. I, I'd, I, yeah, I'd have a, I'd have a private jet fueled up. I wish I, I wish I had the answer. It's like the answer to, what makes connective tissue better? What makes my my knees, my joints ache less? And I'm like, man, I wish I knew. <laughs>
I think the big thing is that we have to stop focusing on the minutia. Mm. Let's look at the let's look at the big levers that are actually going to, you know, move move our progress, improve, yeah. improve our health. And these, Absolutely. you know, we're arguing about minutia. We, we mm-hmm. can just let that go. Um, but but we did want to touch on GLP one and right. <laughs> and its effect on muscle because. Yeah. It's so hot right now. Sure, sure. Um, look, before we go on the GLP ones, I just want to say a huge uh, amen. Preach on the on the big levers. Yeah, you know, uh, if you're not active, try and be active. If you're not lifting weights, lift weights. Uh, try and eat well, sleep well, have a good social circle. I mean, those are the broad strokes. And then after that, the supplements are. I think that yeah, it's the fine tuned needle as opposed to the the big the big needle. Yes. Um, but you know, GLP ones, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it, it's hard to look at them and I know that there's a lot of negative press and people that are, you know, um, how are we going to, you know, what's going to happen to these people. And, but, um, they've been around for a long time. Uh, they've been controlling diabetes for over 20 years. So it's not like these are new quote unquote drugs. Uh, their prescription for weight loss is relatively new and, or their approval for weight loss is new. Um, but they, they're astonishingly effective. And this is wave one uh, in the you know mid to late 70s when we started to get all kinds of antihypertensive medications. Um, we only had one type. Then we had two. Then we had three. Then the pills got smaller. The doses got smaller. And we just got better and better at making these drugs. That's what's going to happen with GLPs. They, they won't be injectables uh, in five years from now. They'll all be orals. They'll be pills. Um, and you know, uh, it's, it's just gonna get, you know, bigger and bigger. So if you don't like it, I, I get it, but, um, people lose a lot of weight on these things and in a weight loss scenario, uh, the kind of rule of thumb, if you're doing it from a dietary standpoint is that at least a quarter of the weight that you lose is lean tissue. And some of that is at least half or maybe more is going to be muscle. Um, so, you know, we, we've done weight loss trials in the past where we've got people to lift weights while they're losing muscle. And in that scenario, then they retain a lot more muscle because, you know, weightlifting is a stimulus Mm -hmm. to actually hang on to lean tissue. Um, we're pretty sure that the same would happen with a GLP-1, uh, drug as well. Um, but you have to probably take a lot of people that a lot of whom may not have lifted weights before and convince them that it's a good thing to do. And, that this is important. I mean, they may lose less net weight on a scale because they're retaining some muscle, Mm -hmm. but that's the tissue that you want to hang on to. And I know that there was a recent editorial sort of pushing back against the, you know, the muscle losses and not being a big deal. If you're in your thirties or forties, probably not. But if you're in your Mm -hmm. fifties, sixties, and you know, giving these to 70 year old people, I don't know that that's as, yeah. you know the same answer to that outcome. Losing muscle at that stage of your life, um, yeah, you're probably not going to get it back. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. and that's a big deal. Yeah, in our seventies yeah. and eighties, yeah, and um, and I think that you know it's fitness professionals. I know you know our probably my me included first response when you hear about a new weight loss medication is oh boy you know you're you're skeptical yeah, yeah. you know yeah yeah um, sure and um but then you know also with the whole muscle loss thing just like you said I mean people that diet are going to lose muscle mm-hmm. if you're you know yeah. and that's GLP one has people eating less it's the same thing as a diet uh, uh, absolutely yeah. so yeah it makes sense that it would also help and hopefully that is a place for fitness professionals to help people stay strong if they're taking these medications. Yeah. You know, uh, I, I think Al, you kind of hit the nail on the head. We, we have a session that we hope gets accepted for next year at the American college of sports medicine, which is a presentation uh, on these patients on GLP one drugs, kind of preaching exactly as you said, for uh, health and fitness professionals to be involved in that process. I mean, you know, they're involved in so many other sort of clinical cases where when you talk about heart failure, we talk about, you know, all kinds of different chronic diseases. Uh, why why not, you know, o- obesity treatment and management? I think it's uh, a natural place for these these folks to, you know, apply their craft and, and help these people. Because at, at some point, and I know like there's lots of other people that I interact with um, on social media who 
you know, our docs prescribing these and they're like, well, people are going to be on these for, for life. And, and that may be true. Uh, I don't mm-hmm. disagree with that. Um, but a lot of people, at least that I've talked to patients, um, at the end of their, you know, when their weight loss is plateauing, they want to get off the drug. And in that mm-hmm. situation, then you've now got to learn how to live at, at a different body weight and how to eat at a different body weight, how to be physically active at that different body weight. Because for a lot of people, the, the weight loss is actually, that's the gateway to doing a little bit more physical activity. So, you know, I, I'm, I, I'm not a huge endorser of the drug, but mm-hmm. at the same time, for a lot of people, these, these drugs are going to change their lives. And, and that to me, I don't think that can be a bad thing, um, but and, they got and you have to work to be on, hand in hand. That wasn't saying you have to be on blood pressure medicine for life or the, you know, and if they can yeah. get off of those yeah. medications, yeah. then there's an, you know, there's, yeah. there's that awesome. it's looking at the whole, at the yeah. whole person and the whole picture. Um, and I've had clients um, that are taking GLP ones and, the lifestyle, you know, that is such a, that's amazing to help someone, Mm -hmm. you know, change their lifestyle. And also some clients reach out, I'm seeing this happen more that they're reaching out to trainers because maybe they have lost, just lost weight, just through the medication and not exercising. Mm -hmm. And they're not happy with the, where their, what their body is left with as far as lack of muscle tone, weakness. And so then they're inspired or motivated to exercise so yeah that's yeah. interesting no, I'm, times. I'm with you i mean I, I think if it's if it's a catalyst for you to you know get a little bit healthier i'm I, i'm all for that i think your your point around you know you just take the drug and you i you know that's i call that passive weight loss we you know you just you just go on a diet and you don't really worry too much about physical activity you, you're going to be okay you're going to be better uh, from a health standpoint but like hands down, and I, I take a lot of slack on social media for this. I'm like, if you want to adopt something that will do much more for your health than just weight loss, like if we'd stop viewing life through a weight loss lens, it's to be physically active and to be stronger. So yeah, you know, let's let's be clear on that. And you know, the the, the effects are just you know, there's it, it's almost embarrassing to talk about, but at the same time, you got to get people to do it, and that's hard if you're you know. Uh, 40, 50, 60, 70 pounds uh, overweight. So if you can lose that weight and that's the gateway into you doing something good for yourself, I'm, I'm all for it. And what uh, about, I know you said that there'll be different, and I think that my, that is the thing that we hear like five years is usually where you really start. And that like after five years, we'll really kind of see what, where we are because we have so many more people taking these medications now Mm -hmm. um and then different forms maybe pill form versus a shot form so um do you think that there'll be different dosages and i know that might this might not be your area but i'm just thinking you know right now people are getting prescribed these medications if they just have a little bit you know there's some people that are taking these that just have a little bit of weight to lose and then of course there's people that have a lot more weight to lose so there's there's so many so many things because it's new (laughs) it's just like ah kind of like the wild wild west right i i, I can't see it going away and, right. and i think it's it's only going to go to smaller doses it's going to become a pill as opposed to an injection i like i i predict that 10 years from now uh this the, these these meds will become uh, as standard as taking uh metformin and rosaglitazone when they came out for type 2 diabetes or you know, you name your beta blocker, calcium channel blocker, ACE inhibitor for hypertension and, you know, all of the fuss around, you know, it's like, oh, it's kind of cheat. It's cheating. Um, it, it, yeah, it drives me crazy too, but I mean, you know, uh, uh, that'll all just die away. Um, yeah. and, but it may yeah. be that five, 10 years from now, we realize that people, you know, some people just don't want to do it that way and that's okay too. Um, but yeah, just, I think it's a huge win personally, but I, I know a lot of people are, are just some, there's some opposition to it. Yeah. It's a cheat. It's, mm-hmm. it's, oh, you're using medicine to do this. I'm like, we use medicine all the time for like, uh, how do you think we added 30 plus years to our life expectancy Correct. in the last <laughs> century? You know? I mean, yeah. clean water was a big step. I get it. But you know, we're so good at end stage treatment to people now. And I'm like, mm-hmm. time to live a healthier life as I, you know, longevity. I'm like, you, you, whatever, you know, you take the extra years, but 
I, I want to be able to do all the things I want to be able to do for as long as I can. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I think the thing is, is it's just not a panacea. It's not for everyone, but it nope. is for some people. We just need yep. to think more critically about it and mm -hmm. be less judgmental that it's not mm -hmm. a cheat. For some people, it is it is life giving. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, I, I, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't think you can you, you can really speak about it unless you've been that person and you've tried it and you, you you've seen what it's done. And to look from the outside in, I think is yeah. Try not to be too judgmental. I I agree. All right, I need to know heavy or light weights. We're switching <laughs> gears a little bit because this is jumping right. around. Well, we have so many questions. <laughs> heavy, yeah. you, you know. So so again. Bring it back to what I told you earlier, right? The rider statement is most people no weights. So, 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 so kind of anything, right? Like, let's start doing something. Um, I, I think it, it, the answer is, of course, it, it depends. Uh, and it depends largely on what your goal is. So if your goal is you need to move heavy loads and... You know, I, I I was on another podcast and the, the woman on there said, oh, well, I, you know, I throw hay bales around and I'm like, well, you need to lift some heavy weights then, you, you know, no, no five pound dumbbells for you. Right. Um, but, it's, you know, somebody else said, well, I really like powerlifting. And I'm like, hallelujah, like go for it. So uh, I think one of the things that I'd like to tell people is that it doesn't have to be heavy all the time. And, and you don't have to, you know, nobody can progress forever and keep going and keep getting stronger all the time. So, you know, take a break, lift some lighter weights and it's okay as long as you're putting out a good effort. And by effort, I mean, it, you know, at the last part, I don't need, you know, the last rep to be that sort of, you know, sewing machine like, oh God, you know, I need a spotter or I'm going to, you know, it doesn't need to be that type of effort, but you know, the last repetition that you do, no matter what the weight is, and maybe no more than, let's say, 25 is the top number of reps you want to do, um, just it's got to feel hard. And so long as you go there, heavier weights or lighter weights, I don't think it matters as much from a muscular standpoint. Now, I will say that I, you know, had recently had a little uh, combo on X on Twitter uh, with somebody talking about bone. And I was arguing that actually it's probably just the doing of the weightlifting that's more important than the heavy versus light. Uh, and this person said, you know what, no, here's a meta-analysis. And I looked at it and I'm like, still not convinced that heavy is better uh, for bone. So, but definitely putting some the muscle under tension, pulling on the tendon, pulling on the bone, that's a key stimulus for, for you to retain bone. So you know, going to the musculoskeletal side of things, I think that it's lifting weights, period, uh, lighter, heavier, that's your choice. And, you know, to me, when people say I don't lift weights and I say why, they're like, well, I don't, I want to get hurt. <laughs> I'm like, well, okay. So first find somebody <laughs> that can show you how to lift weights uh, if you've got the means. And if not, then lift something that's lighter and don't put yourself in a position to get hurt. And um, so from that standpoint, and I know I rub a lot of people when I say that, but that's okay. I'm cool. Yeah. I'm cool with that. Well, I think the big message is that it is for everyone and mm. it doesn't have to be, you don't have to be doing one RMs, you know, nope. you don't have to be doing max nope. weights. Yeah. Maybe you shouldn't be doing five pounds if you can do 50 reps with sure. you know, no yeah. effort, but there's yeah. room for everyone at the table for weightlifting yeah. because the benefits are just so overwhelming for improved health in all parameters. Yep. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So, I, I mean, we're, we're all singing the same tune here. But. Yeah, it's awesome. It's uh, yeah, it's it's great. <laughs> I love having these conversations because in science, there's not a lot of these. Like there's there's actually there's more of these than than I give it credit for. But there's a lot of disagreement too. And you know, I, I, again, you know, uh, the social media platforms when people disagree, I'm I'm okay with disagreement, no mm -hmm. problem. But I'm um, like, let's have a good exchange. Let's not, you know, somebody as soon as you say something, somebody's like, you know, trashing you or, you know, yeah. going after you. And I'm like, talk gets, about your family gets, and yeah, your family. <laughs> you know, the way you look or this yeah. and stuff. It's like, well, you know, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, the, yeah, it, it gets old pretty quick. And so, uh, I, 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 in one moment, social media is great. And in the next moment, it can it can turn ugly, and I, I'm like, oh, geez, like why am I bothering doing this? <laughs> well, you are doing a service though, bringing yes. 
bringing that. some Thank light you. to it. And we'll make, sure, we'll make sure that in the show notes, we have your website and also your social media information yeah, so it. our go listeners can find you and, and have someone that has is, has the knowledge to share that they can follow. Yeah. I, I appreciate that. Thank you. So one last thing before we wrap up, and that is yeah. protein. Yeah. Because as you know, women are tend to their intake tends to be quite a bit lower. And yeah. you know, my clients would be the first to tell you that all all I talk about is where's your protein? How about more protein? <laughs> protein, protein. Yeah. Tell us Same. about that. Um uh, yeah, you know, it's sort of 10 years ago, protein was untouchable. Like it had such a halo around it. And I could say kind of what I wanted about, you know, we need more protein than the RDA and, and then the recommended dietary allowance, uh, probably twice as much. Uh, I had to translate it to about 0.7 grams of protein per pound of body weight. And everybody would be like, yeah, that's awesome. And then now there's a big camp of like protein shortens your life. It gives you cancer. And it's just crazy. I mean, I thought, I spent years trying to push back against protein causes kidney disease. It look, it doesn't, it just flat out doesn't. Um, and it doesn't cause your bones to get soft or anything like that. And and then now it it's sort of, you know, again, it's it, it's mired in this big discussion around, you know, is it good for you? Is it bad for you? I I I'm of the opinion that uh, most women could probably stand to eat more. Um, and would benefit from more. I think you'd find there's a little bit of what we call protein leverage. So when you get more protein, you tend to eat less of some other foods. And it's not that carbs and fats aren't necessary or or fun. Uh, you know, I, people ask why, why I exercise. I'm like, because because I like to have a glass of wine and I like to eat cake, you know. So, uh, yeah. and the exercise kind of gives me a little bit of license to do that, but. Um, I, I, I do think that uh, a little bit more attention to protein, particularly at that first meal of the day, and that tends to be, you know, breakfast is the one meal where a lot of people go pretty carb heavy because that's the advice, heart healthy, carbs, fiber. And um, it, it's kind of the, the I, I call it like the primer meal and full credit to my good friend Don Lehman for this one is to say that if you switch the process on the first meal that you get. Um, and it kind of patterns how uh, your muscles and all the other tissues that use the protein. And, and that's just every, like every tissue. And, and you know, a newsflash for your, your listeners, your bone is 40% by, by composition protein. It's not just as thick of chalk. So, you know, dial in calcium, dial in vitamin D, and then protein is a bone supportive nutrient. Like it, it helps bone. So uh, I think from that standpoint, you know, pick your favorite protein rich breakfast food. If that's Greek style yogurt, if it's like, it's okay to have an egg, you know, like we, <laughs> eggs were on the dirt list for too well, way too long. Um, and, you know, just try and focus on a little bit more sort of protein centric meals and veggies and fruit, like for goodness sake, yeah, eat them, uh, drink a glass of water, you know, like all of these yeah. things that are real yeah. basic uh, you know, kind of things, but, uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, well, if you want to have a good fight, just talk nutrition. <laughs> oh. That's right. Like that's, you're, you're so not we're getting, not, we're not, not making, it. we're not demonizing fats and carbs. They're yeah. needed, yeah. but especially for, you know, women and aging women who are facing bone density loss, sarcopenia, protein is going to be one of the, uh, prime foods that we tend to eat less of. So I'm not saying, oh, we should be doing the carnivore diet. No, we should right. be having a good chunk of our diet should be protein followed up with fiber and carbs and fat and all and the fun foods. Yeah, I mean, it, I, you know, you, you just hit the nail right on the head. I mean, from a functional standpoint, if you want to offset, you know, osteopenia, osteoporosis, sarcopenia, uh, and, and functional decline, then you got to be physically active. I mean, that's lesson number one. The, the nutrient that supports all of that and allows for the, what we call remodeling, I call it the third R. Rehydration is important. Refueling is important. And then repair or remodeling is the third R in terms of recovery. Uh, and, and that's a protein-driven process. And, you know, I, ca I can't say it any simpler than that. But, you know, so the minimum is about 0.3 grams per pound. That's way too low. I think you need to be higher than that up to at least about 
better about 0.7. People can eat more than that, no doubt about it. Like I have lots of athletes that just, and particularly the, the men, um, crazy amounts of protein. And I'm like, you know, at a certain point, the, the benefit is gone. It, you just can't squeeze anything more out of out of the cloth. Like it's, you know, you're like trying to twist it and get mm-hmm. some water out and it's like, it's all done. Um, so it's just, again, it's the broad strokes message. Uh, and everybody go, what about supplements? And I'm like, how much money do you have in your pocket? I'm surrounded by varsity <laughs> level athletes, uh, most of whom are close to broke. And yeah. they go, oh, yeah, I don't have much. And I'm like, well, then go buy a carton of milk. Like just <laughs> get, get yeah. some, get some calcium, get some vitamin D, get, get some other nutrients your body needs, uh, as opposed to, you know, uh, yeah, looking through the couch for change to buy a tub of protein. If you have the means, like go for it. it but all it is, you know, just to be real clear about the supplement, it, it's convenient. It, it like mm-hmm. there's no particular you know nutritional leverage that you get with it. But it but it's certainly convenient. And for male varsity athletes, I'll flat out admit they're not always the most uh, skilled in the kitchen. So protein powder is not a bad idea. Well, you've given us. Lots of food for thought. So much information. We really appreciate it, Stu. If you had a, a wish for our listeners today, what would it be? <laughs> so since we're talking about women, I got to say, like, lift some weights. Like, learn learn, learn how. Uh, teach yourself how. Do something that you enjoy, that you feel good about and good about doing it for yourself. Uh, it could be bands. It could be body weight work. It could be heavy weights. It could be a CrossFit class. Class, I I, like whatever it takes to kind of get you into something that maybe you think, oh, you know, I like who am I going to look like? I don't want to look like this woman, and and I'm like, you're not going to look like that woman. One two days a week lifting, you're you're not, but you're going to feel better, and you're going to feel better about. I think about yourself. The 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 confidence that goes with being a little bit stronger is is I think women find it quite empowering, and so uh, that's my my walk away. For yeah. Sure. And I would have to agree with you. And my wish is for women to, yeah, explore, find something that they can do to, um, and not focus on the aesthetics of it because there's so much many yeah. more benefits than yes, there are aesthetic benefits, but the functional benefits for longevity and quality of life, that's where the, the, the yeah. big win is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the mirror is only it'll only take you so far, and uh, yeah, it's it's not going to turn you into Laura Croft, but it may 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 get a few more years of independent living out of you. And I I don't know. That's uh, that's worth a whole lot in my books for sure. Yeah, the older I get, the more I'm I'm looking at you know less in the mirror and more at you know long term. Of course, I'm vain, but I yeah, sure. Like, there's nothing wrong with that. But that cannot be your only motivation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And for some people, I get it. I mean, you know, everybody. Somebody asked. Everybody keeps asking me about collagen, protein, and skin, and I'm like, look, yeah, I don't. I like. I love good skin, but uh, and when Jennifer Aniston is the spokesperson for Vital Protein, I'm like. Man, I want I want to have skin like her as well, but I don't think it's just the vital protein that Jennifer <laughs> has going on. I think she might have a few other tricks as well, but <laughs> yeah. and she keeps herself in great shape too. And I mean, you know, like Jane Fonda. I mean, good lord, look at the woman. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, I'm like, yeah, Jane's got you know, there's it's there's tough. a good That's amount okay. of beautification going on there as well. But uh, yeah, absolutely. Like what we, we we should all aspire to you know, keep ourselves in that kind of shape, but that's, that's not a collagen protein thing that's going on. No. (laughs) And my wish would be that ladies get some help. And I know I'm saying this as a trainer, but I feel like we have so much more confidence if we know what we're doing and we're doing it correctly because left to our own devices, if we don't know, we're just not going to get the same benefit. So that would be my wish. Yeah, great, great wish. I, I think it's awesome. Uh, a lot of women very confused about lifting weights. And so mm-hmm. I have a PhD student right now, actually, and one of her big things was starting a program called Women on Weights and mm-hmm. trying to just empower women to just learn a little bit more about how the how to and mm-hmm. to feel when you went into the weight room and there's, you know, there's men everywhere it, mm-hmm. that it's okay. And, and there's an area now that's like, this is a women's only area. And I think it's awesome. Yeah. Get, get everybody involved. 
Thanks for listening. You'll find me, Allie, on Instagram at Allie Kerr Fitness. And you'll find me, Shauna, on Instagram at Shauna Kaminsky. Feel free to pop us a DM with questions and or feedback. If you're enjoying the Girls Talk Healthy Aging podcast, please subscribe and share it with other health-minded women. Ratings and reviews are also much appreciated and help us get our message out to a larger audience. Until next time, be healthy and be happy.